the World Social Research Center on the 20th anniversary of its founding and the fifth successful holding of this annual um, socialism um, um, conference. Comrade, the subject on which I have chosen to speak is a long one and it cannot be dealt with in 15 minutes. Just as the Soviet Union was collapsing, I wrote a book on why the Soviet Union collapsed. Those of you who read English and at the same time are interested in the subject, I've got a few copies and if you want to get hold of them, there's no price, it's free of charge. First come, first serve, you can have them. Also, um, because this book dealt with only the economic reasons for the collapse of the Soviet Union, because at the time, I thought everybody knew the political reasons, but as time goes on, young people do not know the reasons, the political reasons for the collapse. So I wrote a new pamphlet on that, that's revisionism and the demise of the USSR. Together, they present mine and my party's viewpoint as to why the Soviet Union collapsed. Ella Rood and I have also written a book on the economic crisis and why we think capitalism has had its day, its well past its sell by date, and the inevitable future of mankind is socialism. I do not believe that capitalism has a very long life to go ahead. I'm not an astrologer. I'm not a soothsayer. I cannot tell you the date on which it will fall. It's a social system. It can carry on forever unless if somebody's going to give it the push. And the working class has got to get ready to give it the push. That's the only way it will go. But um, on, on, before leaving, I'll leave these books here for the center as um, our presence and our appreciation of them inviting us. Whenever you discuss the question of socialism, particularly Soviet socialism, it arouses tremendous debate and fury. People are passionate about it. And sometimes there is so much passion that it generates a lot of heat, but very little light. What is the reason for that? The reason for that, if you would allow me to give a little quotation from Karl Marx, in the domain of political economy, the scientific inquiry meets not merely the same enemies as in all other domains. The peculiar nature of the material it deals with summons as follows in the field of battle, the most violent, mean, and malignant passions of the human breast, the furies of private interest. The English establishment, established church, for example, will more readily pardon an attack on 38 of 39 articles than 139 of its income. Nowadays, <laughs> atheism itself is a minor sin compared to the criticism of modern property relations. Because Imperialism. Because capitalism are interested in defending their property interests, anything connected with the Soviet Union is misrepresented and falsified. The history of the Soviet Union, as written by bourgeois scholars, is a falsified history. Engels not so long ago pointed out that bourgeoisie falsifies everything, and especially the writing of history. And the best paid historiography is the one that's best falsified in the interest of the bourgeoisie. So history that is written about the Soviet Union, but the reasons for its fall, is a fake history. And I want to draw your attention to what I think were the reasons for the collapse of the Soviet Union. I can only indicate what happened. If you want to know the details, you can read in my paper, and you can read in the book that I've written, or the two books that I've written, that would be the best way. The collapse of the Soviet Union did not take place overnight. The Chinese have a saying that it takes more than one night's cold to freeze the river three foot deep. The Soviet Union collapsed over a period of 35 years, and the collapse of the Soviet Union started in 1956. That is three years after Stalin left at the 20th Party Congress of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. At this party congress, in his secret speech, Khrushchev denounced Stalin in a three-hour speech. He portrayed Stalin as a criminal, as somebody who violated social legality, as somebody who murdered millions of people. Every accusation that could be leveled against uh, Stalin 
was leveled and quite falsely leveled. All bourgeois propaganda has relied on that speech and expanded, expanded on, on, on it. Khrushchev, who was non-entity as a theoretician, was in his element as an intriguer and as a, as a destroyer of so, uh, socialism. His attack on Stalin has method in it. It's not just mad, but it is madness accompanied by method. The reason for attacking Stalin was that the greatest achievement of Soviet socialism had been achieved under the leadership of Stalin. The building of socialist industry, the building of collectivized agriculture, the building of a great scientific basis, the building of proletarian culture, the building of diplomatic strength of the Soviet Union, and above all, the crowning victory that was achieved by the Red Army over the greatest fighting machine that imperialism had been able to put in the battlefield since then, that is Nazi fascism. These were tremendous achievements. These are not examples of failures. These are examples of tremendous achievements of the Soviet, Soviet Union. So to attack Stalin was to attack all the achievements, all the achievements made by the Soviet Union during that period of time. In the, their planets, the Chinese communists very well dealt with these distortions of Christian. These days, that book is unfortunately not available. There was a collection of uh, letters written by the Communist Party of China to the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, and it was called A Proposal Concerning the General Line of the Communist International Movement. I wish somebody would publish it. If they don't, I'll bankrupt myself and I'll bring out that book. My, my, myself, I think it needs, needs to be read. And they dealt with these distortions. The Khrushchevites, having denounced Stalin, then went to work with actually negating everything that the Soviet Union had done. They distorted Marxism in the field of theory, ideology, culture, and they distorted Marxism in the field of economics, in the field of political economy. And by distorting over a period of time, they brought the Soviet Union to a point whereby in 1991, Gorbachev could say, we do not want socialism, we want the market. And then that was the end of the Soviet Union. As soon as Christophe had come to power in the field of politics, they indulged in these distortions. First of all, they stated it was perfectly possible for socialism to be achieved by peaceful means. Now, communists are not mad. We do not actually want to be violent. We don't get up in the morning and pick up our gun and say, now who shall we kill? We don't do that. But the history confirms and Marxism teaches that violent revolution is a normal principle. There might be rare opportunities for a peaceful resolution, a revolution which must be grasped at, but these are very, very rare indeed. You cannot generally work on the basic principle that there can be a peaceful transition to socialism. That all you need to do is win parliamentary elections under the rule of the bourgeoisie, have a majority of the members in parliament, and that can usher socialism. Whatever little experience we had of that has actually ended up by drowning the people in blood. Chile is a perfectly good example. Americans remember 9-11, but before that there was a much bigger 9-11, and that happened in, 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 in Chile. Then the Christians put forward the idea that the Soviet Union had become so state and class differences and class struggle had been relegated to the past, the Soviet state had become a state of the entire people. Now, this is an absurd idea. What is state? When does the state come into existence? The state comes into existence as an announcement that society has become driven by class contradictions and class struggles. And state comes there to hold this, the, the ring, and it is a representative of the ruling class over the, over the rule. The state is not some mythical idea that's dropped from heaven. It's the product of the development of society. The moment society gets divided into classes, the moment primitive communism is left behind, the state arises in the interest of a minority of ex exploiters. For the first time in history, the socialist revolution brings into existence a state which represents the interests of the majority. It is the dictatorship of the proletariat. It is a state which is there for two things. One, to make sure that the restoration of capitalism does not take place at the hands of those who have been overthrown. Secondly, it's a state which ensures 
that socialist development, planning of production take place under the guidance of the work of the of the of the, of the working class. The moment the state becomes the state of the whole people, the state has no right to exist. It becomes redundant. And as Engel said, state proletarian state is not abolished, it withers away. It is the bourgeois state that is abolished, that is destroyed in a revolution. The proletarian state, on the other hand, withers away because its functions one after the other become redundant, and there comes a time when there's no reason for the state to exist. So it's absurd to preach uh, the state of the whole people. It is only done in order to actually overlook the class contradictions and allow the class enemy to organize themselves. In connection with the same thing, the first wife preaches that the Soviet party had become a party of the whole people. How can a party be of the whole people? What are parties? Parties represent classes. Classes represent the rule of one class or the other. There is not, it is not a possibility in a class society that the state becomes, sorry, a party becomes a party of the whole, whole people. And in doing so, they obliterated the difference between party members and non-party members and working class and non-working class supply. They then go, went on to completely distort Lenin's theory of peaceful coexistence. Peaceful coexistence was accepted by Lenin that socialism, history proved, can only come to one country or several countries. It does not come simultaneously to all the countries. And to the extent that kept socialist countries are obliged to live next door to capitalists, a certain mode of living with each other has to be evolved. And so you live peacefully to the extent that we build socialism, they are of course working for capitalism. But it does not mean that we do not support proletarian revolution and national liberation elsewhere. It does not mean that we don't work for a proletarian revolution. It does not mean that we give up proletarian internationalism and start collaborating with the imperialism all across the board as the Christianites did, and in doing so, divided the communist movement, and that caused the big rift between the Communist Party of China on the one hand and the, and the Communist Party of the Soviet Union on, on the other. And, and the last political distortion was on the question of war and imperialism. Len Leninism teaches, and life confirms, war cannot be eliminated as long as imperialism is there. Those who would abolish war have to work for the abolition of imper imperialism. The 20th century has seen many wars. The two world wars claimed the lives of 100 million people and wounded many more and destroyed untold wealth created by, by society. Since the Second World War, people will tell you there has been peace. <laughs> well, not if you come from Vietnam, not if you come from Korea, not if you come from a number of places, not if you come from Iraq, not if you come from Afghanistan, not, not if, you, if, 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 if you come from Libya, not if you come from a number of other places. Millions, Indonesia, people are slaughtered by the million by imperialism. That is not peace, unless you look the other way. Unless you're so Eurocentric, it doesn't matter to you. You've got your national health service. Service, you've got your free education, the whole world can burn, it doesn't matter to you. That's not proletarianism, that's straightforward bourgeois nationalism. There, will, there has not been peace, and there will not be peace as long as imperialism lasts. And along with that, the first whites uh, went on to say that uh, there would be no war because there are nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons have changed the course of the war. But well, American imperialism has always used nuclear weapons to intimidate the rest of the world. What has kept peace so far in the world since the Second World War is not the American nuclear weapon. When the Americans had, were the only ones to have nuclear weapons, they used against Japan. Not because Japan was not capable of being defeated otherwise. The weapon was used for two purposes. A, that Japan would surrender only to the United States and not to the Allied powers, including the Soviet Union. Secondly, it was used to give a warning to the Soviet Union, that's what will happen to you if you don't obey our dictator. So what saved the peace was, first, the Soviet weapons, then, I would add, the peace is further saved by the Chinese nuclear weapons and by the small nuclear arsenal of the Democratic People's Republic of, 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 of Korea. Korea. That's what keeps the peace. Americans would invade North Korea like they invaded North, North Vietnam, uh, sorry, like they invaded Iraq if they didn't have the ability to defend themselves. 
So nuclear weapons don't change. It's not weapons that fight. It is people who fight. It's a social system that fights. You have knives in your kitchen. Every now and then, some lunatic uses a knife to kill, to kill their spouse. But that doesn't mean you're going to ban, <laughs> ban, ban the use of knives. We are in favor of comprehensive, universal, non-discriminatory, and verifiable nuclear disarmament. If America would agree, that would be a lovely thing, and let us dispose of the nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons do not serve any useful developmental purpose. But as long as imperialism has it, you cannot ask a socialist country to give up, or the oppressed nations, to give up their nuclear weapons. Comrade, uh, I have been told my time is up. Then, just I can only make one point. In the economic field, the Chris Whites committed the crime of saying that, that only the market can produce efficiently. Ever since the, the Soviet Revolution, ever since the Russian Revolution, it has been the refrain of the bourgeoisie that without profit, without private investment, there can be no efficiently functioning economy. And it took the Christobites revisionists to actually accept that and they started putting in place the various reforms. They brought into, uh, into operation the law of val uh, uh, value as a, as, a, as a regulator of production, profit as a regulator of production, and over a period of time privatized most of the Soviet industry. By the time the Soviet industry collapsed, over 50% of the Soviet industry had been privatized, most of it illegally, but quite a bit legally as well. And in doing so, they created a whole bourgeois class, which was ready to grasp and say, we don't want socialism anymore. Class struggle continues to be, uh, to be fought under the conditions of, of socialism. It does not, does not disappear. And it takes a long time for it, 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 it to do so. And the first wife did everything to expand the sphere of commodity uh, circulation. They privatized the means of production in agriculture. They privatized the machine and tractor station, tractor station, thus throwing billions of rubles worth of machinery into the orbit of circulation. Apart from the fact that in doing so, they wrecked Soviet agriculture because the collective farms were not rich enough to be able to renew their machinery. And by the time the Soviet Union collapsed, it was importing 30 uh, million tons of grain every year. There was no reason for the Soviet <coughs> Union to do that. So by following the wrong political, ideological, and economic policy, the Christianites brought into existence the prevalence of market and of commodity production. Now, Marxism teaches and life confirms that market and socialism are incompatible. It is the, it is the job of socialism to finish the market. But according to Soviet revisionists, only the market could take us to the higher stage of communism, which means you will have commodity production forever. But if you have commodity production forever, you don't really need to be on, read beyond page one of Marx's capital to know that commodity production is capitalism. It's nothing else. If you are going to carry on with commodity production under the condition of higher stage of socialism, i.e. communism, all it means is you're working for the perpetual existence of capitalism. Capitalism does not have a perpetual existence. It is a transitional, historical phase in the development of mankind, and it will fall, it will be felt, it does not deliver to the majority of humanity. Two billion people in the world live on two less than two dollars a day. Two dollars does not buy you a cup of coffee in London. One billion people live on less than one dollar a day. Two billion people do not have basic necessities of, of life. Two billion people are food hungry in the world. It's a system. You know, you count the GDP. GDP does not feed anybody. In, Br in Britain, last year, they calculated that their GDP has gone up by 7%. Why? Because now they can calculate <coughs> profits on drugs and prostitution into the GDP, and the GDP of Britain has gone up by 7%. They were not calculating before. Now, GDP is not calculating real wealth. We want real wealth that builds schools for people, hospitals for people, free education for people, <coughs> nurseries, kindergartens, happier life, decent life, 
good food, not glitzy advertisements and, and 50 different types of colors of ladies' underpants. That's not what life is about. Life is about giving people a happier future. And the first wife destroyed that. And all I can say before I finish, because I really didn't get going on the economic field, and my time is up, is there's a lesson for the Chinese Congress. Because as Einstein used to say, the sign of insanity is to keep on doing the same thing and expecting different results. You cannot follow the market into still socialism and the higher stage of socialism. That's the lesson to be learned. Thank you very much.